Um, so as we always do with uh, the webinars we hold, um, and we do these every quarter uh, on different subjects, we like to have a little uh, checklist in there just so you know what we're hoping you'll get out of it and so that you can track and see what's, um, uh, what's going on. So um, for this one, we're going to be looking at um, how to identify new technologies and hopefully which ones you can disregard, um, or at least how to think about that decision-making process. Um, how tech-driven innovation works, um, and particularly how that applies to passenger communications, because obviously that's the you know what drifting below does. Um, we're going to be looking at the key issues. Um, we're going to look at some current technologies and that kind of thing. Um, and then after the webinar, we will be sending this out to all the uh, everyone who's registered. So we have a really great panel today. Um, we've wheeled out the big guns on this one because obviously it's a bit of a, a, a complicated. Um, uh, subject. So um, I'll be chairing today. Uh, my name is Al Tradinic. I'm I do business strategy and development for 15 Below. So I work with. Uh, I, I'm out talking to a lot of airlines um, all of the time about what their future plans are for technology. So it's a uh, subject close to my heart. Um, I'm just going to go around the rest of the panel and allow people to introduce themselves. Um, we've got Ursula, CEO of uh, XXL Solutions. Morning, Ursula. Good morning, uh, Elle. Good morning, everybody. Um, Elle said before we started, we should uh, give the reason for our existence. So I think the reason for my existence is that I have always been driving change, innovation, moving ahead, improving, and technology, even when technology wasn't yet that good. And I've been working in the executive teams of various airlines in different countries from British Airways to Virgin Express, Brussels Airlines, Lufthansa, Ukraine International, um, Aer Lingus, um, uh, Monarch, uh, partly on product, uh, uh, projects since XXL Solutions times and partly really full-time um, in the executive teams. And I think the one common thing or the evolution that I see is Whilst before the technology was limited, now technology helps us, we can do everything, there is no limit anymore, but the issues that we see is that it's more about where to focus and how to really change the culture and make things happen, and that's the reason why I exist. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ersha. Um, I also have uh, with me in the office this morning, um, uh, Nick Price um, of, things, uh, of, of Things and Material. Um, Nick, good yeah. morning. Good morning. Good morning, Al. Uh, as Al said, I'm a consulting futurist. I help people think about the future. I've worked for Microsoft, Philips, uh, and uh, uh, that's given me an interesting background in technology and the human experience with Philips and Philips Design. So I'm always interested in not just technology, but what's the meaning to people in their everyday lives uh, now and ongoing, how it changes. So it's a pleasure to be talking about transport. I've been doing some work recently in transport and cyber security, which are great places of change, but also a challenge to how we have a, a frictionless travel experience. Brilliant. Thanks, Nick. Um, and we also have Kevin May, um, who is uh, here as uh, our sort of uh, a slight moderator. I'm a bit worried because Kevin often sits in my seat in these panel discussions and he's, uh, he's, he's terrifying to other panelists, so I hope he's not judging me too harshly. Kevin, good morning. Uh, good morning, Al, uh, Ursula, and Nick, and uh, everybody else. So yes, um, my name's Kevin May. I'm a journalist. Um, I have no idea how a journalist can justify their existence, but uh, I've been uh, covering this sector for the last 12 years, not only airlines, but hotels and online travel agencies, anything from the digital travel economy. Um, and it's 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 an interesting time and it goes in waves so I mean when I first started doing it airlines were just about trying to get their act together with their online presence and now they've you know 12 years on they've uh, kind of really upped their game in almost everything that they do from a technology perspective and it's um, from, you know, what I like about it is there is always something always something to write about so uh, you know I've been covering this for a while and I'm now editor-in-chief of a new a uh, new service called Focus Wire, which is part of Focus Right, as many of you know, and um, I'm very pleased to be here. Honoured to be invited, Al, to be on the other side of the fence for a change. <laughs> Excellent. I'm trying to think of some really difficult questions to ask you, see how you like it. Please, please do. Uh, <laughs> um, we were supposed to have uh, Neil Chalk with us as well today, who's our product manager. Unfortunately, he's sick, so um, he, can't be he won't be joining us. 
So before we uh, get into some questions, I just want to sort of set the scene a little bit um, about sort of, um, you know, why we're here and what we're talking about. Um, as you, as everyone knows, uh, technology is driving on at a, a real pace, and that is partly to do with um, the, the way that the people who use that technology are changing, and partly to do with the technology. So those two drivers really push against each other. Um, it isn't just the case of technology creating social change. I think social change also spawns technologies as well. Um, there's a, a lot of research in social anthropology that says that social media was a, is just a technology tool of its age because um, it was born of a generation that wanted to be more connected and more networked. Um, uh, others say that you know the invention of Facebook created that that sort of um, you know social transaction economy. So it's a, it's definitely interesting times. Um, so we're going to be talking about all sorts of things. Um, there will be some things you're familiar with and hopefully some things you're not. Um, chatbots, wearables, machine learning, um, AI, which are not necessarily the same thing. Um, keeping up with all this stuff is obviously very difficult, so hopefully we can uh, get some great opinions from everyone today. Um, some quick stats here from uh, uh, CETA IT Trends Insights uh, from this year. Um, which just goes to show that whilst the amount of money being spent on running the business um, is staying fairly consistent and the amount of money that's getting spent on growing the business is really consistent, the amount of money on transforming the business is increasing year on year. And that's definitely something uh, I found talking to airlines, everyone's trying to think of, you know, can they just do things completely differently and, uh, you know, get some big improvements by adopting technology. There's a great reward in there, um, but obviously there's enormous peril for making the wrong decision. It's a career-defining move if you uh, choose the wrong vendor for something. Um, so uh, that's partly why you have to be really careful about this stuff. So there's a great quote in here that says, brands that create personalized experiences by integrating advanced digital technologies and proprietary data for customers are seeing revenue increase of by 6% to 10%. Um, that for an airline is, is, is a really substantial increase, so that's what it's all about today. Okay, so let's get into the questions, enough of me talking. Um, what are the current tech trends uh, are most pre uh, prevalent with consumers today? I think I'd like to go around the whole panel and just, if you could just give me um, a top trend you see at the moment and how you see that impacting the industry. Ursula? Um, first of all, I would simply even say just using different devices, as I think everyone sees the statistics all the time, mobile is increasing so much, just to get this seamless, that you start on one device and you can continue on another, is a very simple but um, ever increasing trend, voice, and simple personalization. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, we're definitely seeing um, some interesting trends in mobile at the moment that are, are becoming non-specific to an app. It's just capabilities of a mobile, um, which is quite interesting stuff from our point of view. Nick? In the present, there's a, there's a couple. I think there's an interesting thing around um, the, the frictionless part around payments. I think payments mm. are becoming easier and easier to make between parties as opposed to contracts. Uh, and I... I the um, uh, well, interconnectivity is, uh, what's on the horizon is interesting with uh, 5G coming up in a few years time how we have even richer more robust uh, interconnection and so that that, that what the connectivity will just improve you know? yeah that's hope so the future is all going to be about bandwidth isn't it, ultimately um, Kevin any trends that are exciting you at the moment I, I don't know if it's a trend that's exciting me but I think it's it's something that's very important and that's obviously you know, we're all industry people or writing about the industry and we, we like to think we know everything, which hopefully we all do. But the point is, is I think you always have to put your mind in the minds also of the consumers and how they see things as well. And I think what some brands seem to forget is that one, consumers don't care about the minutiae of various things, whether it's social media, whether it's a, a chat bot or whether it's an Alexa type device they just want to be able to communicate and they don't care about the channel and I think with them um, you know for fear of bringing up Millennials and things like that you know as because everyone always talks about Millennials but the point is is that they don't really care 
the form in which they communicate with the brand they just want to be able to communicate with the brand so uh, for an airline perspective you know we're going to get into airline specific stuff but I think it's really important that they understand that there isn't just channel specific anymore it is multi-channel omni-channel cross-channel whatever you want to call it so I think you just need to be careful airlines need to be careful that they don't lose sight of that absolutely I couldn't agree more I, if we have quite a lot of statistics um, and if anyone's ever interested they can email us um, on you know when it comes to trying to contact people because we do a lot of work in disruption and that kind of thing it's quite it's sort of vitally important for our airlines to get hold of the maximum amount of people and you if you look at the spread when you try different channels and you have to try you often have to you know use four or five different channels to get hold of you know if you want to get hold of like 80 90 percent of people particularly it, if you're in a compromised if you're in a troublesome situation yeah, exactly. you need to find the right yeah. path for the if you're not at home you might not have your data turned on you might have your data turned on you know you came in what's there what's going to be their demands and what's that going to um you know what's that going to drive airlines to have to innovate around yeah, I mean this 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 is an interesting area because um, you and I, Nick, uh, our sorry, were at a conference just what a, a month or so ago, and um, one of the inverted commas hot topics was this idea that airlines, all of a sudden, and not so sudden for some of them, but generally there is this drive to becoming retailers. So they're not just selling a bum on a seat in a aluminium tube; they're trying to do other things, and I think that has a quite a fundamental effect on how they then have to communicate and have that relationship and an engagement with their passengers because it isn't just about making sure they check in, making sure they actually get on the plane, making sure that they deliver their luggage to them. That kind of broadening of services into other things just has um, on the one hand lots of challenges but you know if you try to be more half full about it lots more opportunities. So I think as a result of that because it isn't just about you know, giving them the ticket or selling them the ticket and making sure that they, you know, pick up their boarding pass on an app. It's hitting them, them at the right time with the ability to sell them a duty-free voucher or something like that. So I think just broadly, the this kind of uh, broadening of retail services just changes the dynamic a little bit about the way airlines have to think about how, how they communicate and just operationally it has a, has a much bigger effect and that goes back to what I said previously is that in, in a multi-device world and in a multi-channel world being able to do that on every type of device or every type of channel whether it's a voice related one or whether it's a, an automated chatbot related one needs to be taken into consideration. So it's kind of it's partly it's service and retail working hand in hand there rather than it being which has been quite traditionally siloed I feel in um, but then also being able to, you know, have all the wiring, not you know, available. I suppose is part of it. It's bit making those options so that everything can be API'd up and connected through. I mean, that's correct. So the one on the one hand, or the one end of the, the conversation, you've got people like Ryanair who claim to be driving to kind of Amazon for travel, or they're trying to Amazonize travel for want of making up a word. But and then on the other end, you've just got an airline that wants to be able to sell car rental. And everyone else is kind of in the middle. So yeah. as, as you, you're correct. You know, do we just do separate things and think about those as individual lines of business, or do we think about putting it into the wider kind of this is what we do as a carrier, as your kind of service provider that gets you to where you want to go? Absolutely. Well, what is your perspective from outside the industry, then? Nick? I'm, or, or I'm, I'm interested in the mention of Amazon because I've been I've been talking to them recently, and it, it it's. It strikes me there's a limitation of the language that we use. We talk about transactions and purchases and retail and so forth. And yet you talk to Amazon, and they'll talk about how do we delight the customer. It's mm. a completely different way of thinking about the customer experience. And when they and when someone presses a button on the website, from then on they think about the promise. What's the promise that they've made to the client, and how are they going to deliver on that promise, the product, and also the experience of receiving it. So I think that's why I'm always hesitant about things with tech because it just looks like everything's related to tools, but yeah, not, yeah. it's not. It's really how does the customer feel at the end of it? What's the promise? Like, that's awesome. That could definitely work. Ashley, what do you think? What are the challenges for the airlines around this that you're working with? Them? 
think what it means, what um, we have just been talking about in terms of retailing, the underlying issue is that the whole airline world is not made around the customer, it's made about PNRs, single moments. And I think this unique view of the customer, even because this is missing, makes it even more difficult to what has just been said, to think as a retailer, to think about the customer and how to uh, delight the customer, how to address the customer and uh, customers in the right way, the different types of customers. And this coupled with, I would call it the zero tolerance by customers because they get used to the Amazons of the world, to the Googles uh, and so on. They get used to a proper performance and continuous improvement all the time. And uh, so they don't accept anymore that something is poorly handled, that they don't find the information, that they are offered seats during their check-in, even though they have already booked seats before. So yeah. I think this is actually the major challenge that airlines are facing because it means some really structural change in terms of thinking, not thinking operationally, but thinking customer, but also making this possible in terms of technology. I do, I do, yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a lot of good stuff coming out with, you know, like NDC and One Order and all of the other initiatives that are out there at the moment. I, I, I you know, they're, they're a good idea if, if they work and people can adopt those technologies. But I, I, all the airlines I talk to seem very confused about how, how complicated that's going to make the world, if you see what I mean. I actually think, looking at, you know, going back from the Amazon point of view and thinking, you know, what was the promise is quite interesting. It's just, Kip here, just if I could just, just yeah, interject on. On, on this. I mean, I think what's the flip side of this is that airlines know they have to do something. You know, I think it's uh, IdeaWorks uh, forecast, I think was it was $60 billion in ancillary revenue global airlines last year. So airlines have woken up to this idea that not only can they sell tickets, but they can also make some extra money, or they can discount on the tickets and upsell on other things. So there is this, there is, you know, it's hard cash that's also having an effect here because they realise that they can make some more money, and that's the thing that, you know, airlines need to do. And I think sometimes, you know, when we're all comment, commenting and commentating on things like this, we sometimes forget that well, it is also for money making money as well. I totally agree. I mean, I actually, I've seen very few initiatives that are good for the passenger experience that don't make more money as well, because I think a lot of it's, um, it's cutting out the fat. It's not, you know, like uh, Ursula said, it's not randomly trying to sell someone something they're never going to buy, you know, it, that kind of, it's optimization of the experience, I suppose, is what I'm talking about. I think I'm interested, it's also, there's a, there's a problem around uh, cybersecurity, around that data ownership, because you may yeah. have a fine amount of information about a passenger, but the passenger's preference and personalization may reside somewhere else. So how do you have access or what permission has that passenger given for that information to be used to improve their journey? And so making it um, an advantage for that passenger to share, to share information is also useful for them. Absolutely. That data, you know, the, I mean, data is something we can talk about all day long, and we have done, actually. But um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's interesting to see from a legislation point of view, we've got GDPR coming in, we've got, you know, a lot of legislation around locking down people's data, but mm. a lot of the survey trends show that customers would rather you share their data if it means they get a better experience. There's yeah. a lot of, you know, a lot of the results, are, you know, talking about millennials again, they don't, you know, they, they would much rather get spammed with things that they want <laughs> than just get spammed generally. It, the issue isn't whether they want you to share the data in most cases, it's just they don't want you to screw up using it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Brilliant, thanks for that. Right, so moving on to the next one. This is a, an interesting uh, question. What do you think people are getting, what do you think, which trends do you think people are kind of making a lot of noise about at the moment, which are either being handled badly or are just a completely bad idea in the first place. Um, uh, any any input on that? Nick? I, I think there's lots of talk about AI and machine learning and chatbots. And, uh, you know, you, you, you can stretch them out and say well, AI is in, in the deep future, machine learning is the medium range, and then we've got chatbots. The thing about chatbots is what will, it's, it's like happened to make an analogy back to the old days of spreadsheets where people embedded a lot of logic in things and then it all got spread around an organization, it all diverged. So yeah. the usefulness of having a, a honed customer experience that you can have in one central place or cloud-based and be available for people 
is uh, is useful. And per and, but then the personalization to merge it with personalization. So. Yeah. So, like we, I mean, there's so much. I, I think there's a lot of hype gets generated around these things whenever they come out, like Google Glass and everything else. Yeah. It's about, you know, it, it, I think sometimes, and I I think there's a lot of airlines agree with this as well. Actually, that it's there, there's still a lot of uh, progress to be made. Just getting you know the basics sorted out. If you it's not just progress by a technologist. There has to be something in the market, and people go through an experience of learning because you don't know what the the emergent effects of something are. Mm. So it's more of a dialogue with your passengers, learn from them, and then pull it back in. So you you, you refine something over time. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Ashley, how are you? What what's your opinion as somebody who's probably on the front line of helping airlines adopt these technologies? Or you know, you you do a lot of change management and things like that with airlines, don't you? Yeah. I think on the one hand, there are lots of opportunities with it. And if I take the example of chatbots, this year it's like chatbots is the hot topic and you hear almost every week there's at least one airline having introduced um, a chatbot. Um, and if you look in some countries, people really even see the human side of the bots. So you could imagine that this can really help to get a better customer service 24 hours, seven uh, days a week. Um, and even in a human way. Um, and I think there is a similar thing with messaging where you can really interact, you can get the feedback from customers. But what I see is this will only help if you solve the underlying problems. And there is a big risk if you haven't solved your processes and the underlying problems, then this could actually be even turned into a problem. Uh, what do I mean with it? Just to give um, some examples, if some of the problems which airlines face today is that a customer might contact the call center, but the agent as actually can't give a response and has to maybe send the customer to somebody else. Uh, or the customer gets a different inf some different information at the airport versus information they already get in the app and information they get from an airline um, employee. And I think this is one of the underlying problems that the processes are not harmonized, there's too much complexity, there's no knowledge sharing within the airline and there are no systems to get even staff feedback about what are some of the biggest pain points coming up. And I think they would almost need to use even the chatbots and even the messaging first to get the staff into this and to get the information around to ensure that they are really aware of where the issues are, what are the most common um, issues or even points where they can sell more to use the chatbots for and then turn this into an advantage. I think there's a, there are very good opportunities even for revenue earning apart from the customer service side. If you look at, I, I like the seat example because it's so such a big issue. Um, airlines manage to sell, make a lot of revenue by selling seats, but then they have aircraft changes last minute they are not prepared for it, the customer arrives at the airport quite often, the airport staff isn't even prepared for it, so the customer gets a bad surprise but paid a lot of money for a seat. So if you used a chatbot, if you used your notification to inform the customer beforehand to offer choices immediately, then actually you can get this into an advantage. But to do that, you need to get your processes right and you need to even understand that this is a main pain point and that you will not manage to keep your ancillary revenues up if you uh, if you continue having such problems. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we found with um, we've been uh, talking to a lot of airlines about chatbots for you know a lot of the disruption and flight status notifications and that kind of thing that we do at the moment, and we can definitely see some uses for it. But there is an assumption that you you know you are going to just instigate a conversation with someone, or they're going to request it and say you know hi Alexa tell me about, um, you know, how's my flight going? And then Alexa's going to tell you your flight's late. And then you'll ask Alexa what time you need to get to the airport then and that kind of stuff. And to me, that is just speeding up uh, uh, the slow process of them having to phone the airline. It doesn't actually do what, it, what you want, which is to give live relevant information to everyone. And that's passengers and, you know, staff members and the call center and everyone all at the same time to say, the plan has changed, this is what's happening now, these are the options, and to push that out in an empathetic way so that people can actually deal with it, rather than, I don't want to ask the airline if my flight's late or 
any of that stuff. I want them to tell me what you yeah, know. You want, what you I want a notification rather than, exactly. than than having to find out the yeah. problem yourself. I might want to interact on choices and that kind of thing, but I shouldn't have to draw the information out. What do you? Uh, Can I just add one uh, point to this? Sorry yeah, to. Um, just one very good example, I think, related to this as well is um, a life example from a very big airline spending millions, hundreds of millions in technology. With the delay, the customer be the customers being on the way to the airport or just about to leave, they get this message, we are very sorry, your flight has been cancelled, we will keep you posted in due course. The customers have had arranged meetings, dinner meetings, whatever, uh, personal uh, issues or business issues, and they get a message and they just get irritated because they don't get a solution. And I think that's part of a problem. And then calling, they get into further trouble because they still don't get a solution. And that's, I think, where, uh, where it comes in. If you don't get your, your, your basics right first, then this will actually cause more problems than yeah, it will help. Totally, speeding that up through self-service isn't going to help, is it? It's not going to... But also uh, thinking that the passenger is the person, the focal point, because the passenger might have a PA or a service that arranges their agenda, so it's, right, it's a yeah. different, it's a cascading notification, how do you... Yeah, pushing okay. notifications out to travel agents, for instance, who booked it, yeah. that's a... Right, we're not getting into that yet. Like I said, we, we always get into this debate. And I'm not I thought doing Ursula brought up a really interesting point, tucked in one of her comments was about um, systems working at a different pace because I've been in an airport and my app's been telling me more about the yeah. status of the, of the flight than on the, than is on the screen and there's that that starts to also split people apart. It creates a them and us as opposed to everyone gets the same service. But that doesn't mean you deliver the most mediocre result. You want mm. everyone to have the best real time information. It's really interesting to say that actually. We so we do live flight updates and sometimes we've had to slow them down so that they arrive at the same time as the screen in the airport to yeah. try and stop causing so much confusion. But I saw a thing recently with a uh, I think it's Virgin Trains or something and they're actually using it to create a them and us situation yeah. where they're going, if you want to be in the know, if you want to be the first one sitting in front of the train door when it opens Get the app, and that's how we're going to well, do that, it. Well, that'll get the other 85% of people that you mentioned <laughs> not to use the app. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and I just think, like, you know, it's not that kind of thing's interesting, but I don't think that type, you know, creating that type of tension is necessarily very helpful. What do you think, Kevin, about this stuff? Do you see any. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the, the, the question that's on the screen. You know, are airlines getting too involved with messaging platforms and chatbots? I mean, the, the simple answer is no. I mean, they, they have to try these things. I mean, as I mentioned in my kind of introduction at the beginning is that I remember 12 years ago when airlines were agonizing over how to do their own websites and how they should do things like that and it would take them ages to figure it all out whereas now there is this I, I don't want to you know, make too much of the whole Steve Jobs way of thinking but at least airlines are now going down that kind of road which suggests strategically we should just try stuff because it allows us to get an understanding of what our consumers, our passengers are doing and how they communicate, not just with us as an individual airline, but how they communicate with anybody that's important in their life, whether that's friends, family or other brands. So to be able to just try these kind of things and if it doesn't work, you dust yourself down and you move on and try something else. So just back, you know, back to the question, no, they need to be trying lots of other things. now. For airlines, that could be quite diffi difficult. You know, they're huge organisations, and you might have, you know, you might have the funky developers on the one end of things who want to do all this kind of stuff, and you might have the people on the other side, the revenue people, that are saying, well, uh, well, this isn't going to make us any money. What's the point? So that's where you get, uh, on the one hand, some kind of conflict, but then hopefully the more progressive airlines are saying, well, let's just try things because they can be relatively inexpensive to introduce, and ultimately we will learn something about the way our passengers behave and what they want from us. So no, they're not getting too involved with stuff like this. I I do agree with you. I do because I, I, I think it's changed. I think there is a mindset in the industry where everyone's thinking of the PSS contracts, which are 10, 15 years, and you know career-defining moves. But actually, you can pick up and drop a technology relatively easy these days. You know, you can try it. If you don't like it, you can scrap it. I think I do think with things like the messaging platforms, I think that's a no-brainer for airlines because Facebook's spending 
gazillions on their app, use that instead. Why make your own app? Like, Indeed. It's, just, it's great with them. Do you know what I mean? They're like, your passengers are probably sat there whiling away their hours on Facebook and WhatsApp anyway while they're stuck at the airport. It makes sense. Yeah, people are more familiar with messaging as, a, 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 as a, both in the workplace and in the personal space. So it, it's, it's a technology that you can try out. Yeah. And it's a bit, it's pretty straightforward Facebook messaging and stuff. It's just a, getting the passengers into a mindset that you might talk to them on that channel and yeah. you know getting that sort of sign up and all that kind of thing in the process. But it also there's a lot of opportunities in there. With we and like I said, we're not talking about contact details and agency bookings because we always talk about that. But um, there are a lot of opportunities to get around those contact detail issues if you use social media messaging instead because you can you know you can. You don't necessarily need contact details. It's just just on that point, Al. I mean, you, I've just noticed a couple of words that you said. Is you, you said getting the passengers into that mindset, and I, I, I do think sometimes it's actually getting the airlines into the mindset because oh, it's, totally, consumers, yeah. it's consumers and passengers that are potentially driving all this, rather than the carriers themselves. Frankly, not many of them are that advanced to keep up with trends in consumers. They react rather than be proactive. Mm. Arguably, and I think I it agree. goes back to uh, what you said earlier, Kevin. That the thinking should not be we need to test that technology. The thinking should be what are actually our customers and our staff working with every day, and how do we reach maybe more customers, yeah. different customer groups we haven't reached yet, or how can we communicate with our customers better, and therefore use the technology. And then just be clear what you want to use it for. Because I've seen many airlines who have been, have had then the courage to introduce something, but because they didn't really think about, they wanted to do messaging. Instead of thinking, because everyone was doing it now. And someone in the board said, oh, but why are we not yet doing this? And why don't we have a chatbot? Instead of thinking about what to use it for, and then start with this and do that well. They just introduced it, didn't have a clear strategy, and then it failed. And they said it failed, but it could have been, become a big success. Yeah, and I suppose another thing on that is that if you, if you think of it from a generation perspective, those that might be using these slightly uh, less conventional channels to communicate with a brand, you know, if if we are to make the wild assumption that most of the people that use those are of a younger generation and potentially just leisure travellers, at some point, many of those will become high spending, regular passengers, corporate passengers, who are really the ones that you want to make money from because they spend more money. So uh, that kind of shift between it being just a funky service that young people use to something that becomes a little bit more widespread across the passenger base, I think is really important. Mm. I mean, we always think it's you know these things are great, but they're all just channels ultimately, and you've got to work out. Exactly. You've got to be, have got to be agnostic. Like chatbots, grand. Facebook message is great. WeChat's great. You know, email's good. You've got to look at these because everyone, if everyone wants you to use that channel, that's the channel you have to use, as well as everything else. You wouldn't have ignored sending text messages or emails when those you know like people probably did to begin with, ignore them as channels. But you've got to do them. You've got to do both. You've got to do all of it. Like, what do you how so? You can Nick. You can talk with a lot of people on how to pick. Like, um, you know, how, how? What do you do? I think channels are. I think channels are interesting in that you, you can't just throw a technology at people and expect it to fire mm -hmm. people to fire up. So, what's the big attractor to people to go onto that to that channel? So, you talk about Facebook, for example, and um, to the travel industry. It strikes me that Instagram is all about people traveling their trip, their travel experiences. So and that might not seem like something you can directly apply to the airline industry, and yet it's already got a great attraction for travellers who already use it. So mm -hmm. how can that how can that medium be expanded? Because you've got the compelling draw towards it. Yeah. I think Instagram, if you wanted to pick a messaging channel that's like as far away from the experience of the, your average <laughs> IT department, <laughs> like, that's probably right up there. Like, but it, but yeah, but it, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's an no, interesting it's, challenge. It's, 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 a, it's a it's a provocation, you know. You just don't know and it is that's what people use when they travel. So why not use it? Yeah, yeah. Travel. How can how can you turn that into a new proposition? Just the way that Facebook groups have a, have emerged for business usage. How could the same thing be? How could Instagram be used in, a, in an interesting yeah. way, particularly as a visual medium? And that's one of the, it gets a, it's a, a cross language medium. And I think that's an interesting thing about mechanisation and AI and chatbots. You start to break up, break over those language, ba language mm, and cultural absolutely. barriers. These yeah. visual medium. Yeah. Just on that note, actually, it's a question for later on. I want to ask it now because I think it's kind of um, it's relevant. 
how and I'm going to direct this to you first, Nick, and then I'm going to, uh, I'm going to ask you, Ashley, to get ready. Um, when someone on the board does say, why aren't we using Google Glass or something like that, it looks really cool, why haven't we done this already, what do you do to get them or their teams to think clearly about that? As, and, you know, and how, do you, how do you go, yeah, I know that's very exciting, and you, you know, someone's just embarrassed you in the pub because you don't do it already, but... Yeah. You know, how do you how do you get that kind of balanced approach to these things? Well, I think I think balance is the key word there. Is you get people to think about it. it's a collaboration. You don't sit there and some genius comes up with an idea. You have to have a a, like a collective brain trust to put their their heads around it and think about it. And Google Glass was an interest. And it was an interesting experiment, as it were, and the problems that I had around people finding it was socially divisive because people could see something about someone else that they couldn't <laughs> see. And that wasn't found out until it went into the marketplace. <laughs> so how, 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 how do you feel about it? So you're suddenly differentiated. So in terms of the board, it's, it's, um, it's, it's being rational. Yes, you can do this. Yes, you can do this. And then suggest a way forward. And um, Kevin mentioned Apple earlier on. And they are an interesting company in how they used to innovate because instead of using test groups to try out an innovation, they said, no, well, no, we, 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 we know what people want, and they, they delivered it. So I think that the airline industry can use its expertise to put things in hands and put things in people's hands that they don't even know they need yet, and that, mm. to me, is that way of delighting people. That's like, super cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. 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 KLMing, is it? is it probably called in the airline industry. Um, Ursula, what do you think on that? Just, you know, when you're, because you obviously you know, the sort of person that when they, someone comes up with that crazy idea, it might fall to you to try and deliver it. <laughs> what do you do to get people to think in a clear way about what is a good idea to do next and what isn't? Yeah, I think your example with the board, and probably many of the people listening um, might agree with this, it's sometimes it's actually amazing how really ideas from the board or other people in the organization come in and are extremely subjective because they have just had a trip or they have just talked to somebody and heard about this, and then they think, oh yeah, this sounds interesting, why are we not doing this? I think the only way how to go about this, because you want to move forward, so you don't want some airlines have this culture to say all the time, we can't do this because it's what you don't want. Um, but if you have a clear way of saying, actually, we want to be innovative, and this is how much we we want to do. Every month we want to come out with something and this is how we are going to evaluate it. Maybe we will sometimes have um, something which we just do because we want publicity and it fits our brand and it is a cool thing, we might not even make money with it, but it's actually something, it even helps the culture and it's, um, so this is where you might actually say, Google Glass, yeah, let's experiment with it because we think we've heard from lots of customers, it's somehow exciting, we can do something about it. Or Alexa, it's the one thing and we actually need to deal with it, or uh, the Google Home, we want to be part of the interconnected home, we somehow need to think how we get into this because this is a strategic thing where we can really make a big difference in the long term and it's worthwhile some investments. Um, if you have a strategy to be able to say this is how it fits together and this is why we think we should concentrate on this rather than that one because we cannot do all of the projects and that's what I see all the time that airlines are overwhelmed with projects and in the end they don't do anything right and they take far too long and they don't really achieve um, anything or very little uh, versus what they could do to really make a big difference. Um, and I think one way of doing it is also simply to even use um, customer input and staff input in a quantitative way because this is how you can also convince a board where they might think Google Glass is actually the big thing we need now, but you actually say, look, we've got so many customers asking about this, our staff tell us that all the time we are being asked about this, or this is what concerns them, or it's a big pain point. We need to solve that first, and this is uh, how we are going to achieve it, and this is what it will help us with. Then I think that's the only, that's the only way how you can counteract it, because otherwise you will be running zigzag all the time and just respond to any individual subjective request and end up not being able to achieve anything. Absolutely. Um, I know we need to move on, but uh, one more question to Kevin. I, we've been seeing a lot of um, 
there are a lot of airlines setting up tech incubators and that kind of thing. I know you've done a, a fair bit of sort of Dragon's Den style uh, moderating recently and that kind of stuff. Do you think these sort of tech incubators are the right way to go for airlines to, to bring on new yeah, technologies? I mean, just, just, kind of just, just, to, just to comment on the last one, I mean, not that it would be terrible to suggest that Virgin Airlines only ever does things for publicity, but they were the airline that really kind of threw themselves into the Google Glass thing where they had that um, concierge service at Heathrow and it came, they got loads of publicity and then it went pretty quickly because they obviously realized that it was either pointless or nobody was using it but this feeds into my, the answer about incubators. So what, what, what that illustrated is that airlines, going back to the previous point, is that airlines are trying to think in a slightly more tech world kind of way. So for example there was, uh, 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 there was a representative from KLM, the airline again at the aviation festival who was saying you know they try half a dozen things every couple of months and often the, the management team wouldn't even know about it because they're just trying to drip these in to the, the, the kind of whether it's communications, whether it's things that they're doing online and they'll be able to you know, using that kind of test and learn principle that has been championed by the likes of Expedia and Booking.com, for example, let's just see if something works. And if it doesn't, we can just quickly remove it because we've got such a huge passenger base. No one will really understand anyway. So, and then they can get some great learnings from it. But to the point about incubators, this is where it's got really interesting because one, I think there is a small element of let's do an incubator because it's cool. You know, but I think what it's a trend uh, itself, Lufthansa, but... <laughs> yeah, it is a trend in itself. You're absolutely right. Lufthansa has done this. Um, uh, JetBlue has done this. Uh, BA has done this with its Hangar 51 project. I think there is a recognition in the industry that perhaps they are not the smartest people within an in, within an airline. We might not actually be the smartest people to come up with stuff. So let's work with some external organizations. We can give them a little bit of funding. We can bring them in under the hood. Let them play around with our technology, our APIs, our platforms, etc., etc. And they may be able to come up with something that we and all our brainiacs were unable to come up with previously. So that's where I think the incubator trend has come in is that yes it's great for publicity and you can support some startups and you may fund the next Uber for example but more likely you're just going to come up and start working with some people that have a really really bright idea so that's the main motivation behind incubators for sure. I think they're good, I th the only problem I've seen with some of the incubators is I, th I think if you're not good at finding or spotting trends in technology having people do a startup on it isn't necessarily going to help. Picking that right startup is going to be very difficult and working out whether they're doing it right is also going to be hard. If you're completely in the dark about what something should do or how it works, it's just as easy to get fooled by someone who started it six months ago as it is to get fooled by a vendor who's been doing it for 20 years. It's, you know, we've seen a lot of airlines try and replace existing services with an incubator on the assumption that it won't cost them very much because they own part of it. <laughs> it works, they'll make loads of money out of it, but it doesn't let, you know, like it, it that takes, it actually kills entrepreneurship because, it, you know, there's vendors out there who've been doing it for years and actually you just need to go and see them to do it because they've got all the learning and they're not trying to do it by trial and error, you know. it's a, I think it's, I think it's, been, it's probably been said by a lot of people, it's about thinking clearly about what you want to innovate on and how you're going to measure it and all that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah great. I think it's, it's also about almost. No, no, also about, um, it's also almost about well, how do we get our innovation culture? It's too much hard work to achieve this in house. Let's outsource it and get it outside. And there is mm. actually it, it it can be um, this way. And there is actually some very interesting research out there where they on a made by many on a regular basis. Um, uh, does the research about those uh, incubator innovation hubs and so on and what the successes are and it's still early days but there are some indications about this you need at least you need at some stage to start thinking about bringing it together again and you still need to get your house in order and get the involvement and buy-in because otherwise you will not succeed absolutely um, I think we've probably got time for one more question yeah, as long as we keep it quick. Um, can we move on to one about data? Yeah. So, I, you know, data obviously is the key to all of this. Um, 
we touched on it earlier with that kind of thing. But what do you, I just want to talk about, I think, what the, what is the biggest challenge, what's the biggest opportunity? We haven't got long, so keep it a little bit short. Um, uh, Nick, what do you think? Uh, I, I, something we touched on earlier around the, the, the problems around data is the new idea of secure, securing that, the ownership of it, uh, the privacy of it, and uh, how we deal with that, particularly in the airline industry, cross-border, because you're going through dis different legislative domains. Mm. So it's almost, it's almost like a, a does, does the airline industry itself need its own data protection commitment so it can have a global a global standard of um, yeah. privacy. Yeah. That's not going to happen. Yeah. Unless everyone adopts the one in Germany, I think. Which, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we find all the time, actually, when we do work with airlines to try and find just simple things like contact details, we can do that and correlate between different data sources, but mm. then you have to check and see where the customer is or where the airline is or where the airport is and make sure you're not about to, you know, breach uh, data protection laws. I think, I, think, I think the thing about, uh, the other interesting bit about data is it's not so much the data that you have, but your ability to ask an interesting question of it. Mm. So you can have everything, you can increase your touch yeah, points, increase your measurements, but who can make a really good question? That's something <laughs> Ursula mentioned early on. How do, you, how do you ask a good question of the data so you get an insight, an insight that you can leverage, and that's a, that's a, different, that's a different type of thinking? Totally is, yeah. yeah. Well, what do you think, Ursula, about data? How are you? How, how are airlines doing on this? In your opinion, what are their what are the wins? What are the losses? Yeah, I think many are actually quite lost with it because every this trendy word of big data. There is actually lots of data around, and there has been actually for years, but they haven't really been able to capitalize on it because they didn't think about what they can use it for. And they have also sometimes maybe not done the first step to simply even ask the customer, ask the staff, just look, just ask some of the simple questions to know um, already get some indications of where your first steps can be in terms of what data can sell, how you can better approach them, what they are really looking for, where to put your priority. I think there are two big trends, so it's very important to slice the elephant before you can eat it, to really think about what you want to do with them, and then step by step where you can make the big, biggest difference, and then approach it. I think there are probably a few really big opportunities um, like blockchain, which can help in terms of um, working with third parties to get more um, efficient, to be able to, in terms of selling your ancillary revenues, to do this um, directly um, with a customer in simple ways and even cut out some of the complexity and some of the cost um, and inefficiencies which are there uh, today. In terms of uh, social media messaging, there are some um, bringing all of this together to really then understand, uh, to get this unique customer view. I think there are big opportunities um, in there and some airlines have started working on this. And uh, with that, you can almost come to this vision of your personal shop assistant in your corner shop who really knows you well and but who is there for you seven times 24. And then this concept of dark data, which is also increasing, which is really looking all of the data which are around and really try and start some of your big problems. And this can even be in network planning, this can be operational or how you communicate with your customers to really see what are customers really asking for in terms of whether it's destinations, whether it's um, certain um, product um, experience elements which they are really lacking and help this to focus and prioritize. Mm, totally. Kevin, what do you think yeah, yeah, what's I mean, good and what's bad out there? I mean, data connects the dots in everything in the industry, doesn't it? At a, fu yeah. at a fundamental level. And, and interestingly, I remember when the the big data moniker started being banded around a few years ago. I remember someone very senior at a GDS, a global distribution system, saying, you know, we were the first big data companies in travel, but we just didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> and I think what's happening is that people are realizing not only what they can do to slice and dice it, but also how they should try and collect more of it, one, without being creepy, two, by adhering to data protection laws and things like that, and then ultimately try and make the customer passenger experience better than it is. Now whether that 
you know that's where you have the fine line between providing a service and providing an enhanced service or whether you just end up using it for marketing which you know obviously has that kind of irritation factor to it what I think where this where this area gets really interesting is around the idea of sharing of data and that does go back to what you know Nick was saying and others have said around data protection and who should have the right to do this that and the other and you but the point is you're for, forever hearing airlines and airports in particular saying well we would like to be able to improve the customer experience because we've got all this great data and it would be wonderful if we could connect the dots between what airlines are doing and what airports are doing but often they don't want to share the data with each other because they want Absolutely. to have inverted commas, they, they want to have in inverted commas ownership of the customer, and ownership of the customer means everything from marketing to CRM, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you know, are we giving up the opportunity to improve the customer experience for the sake of selfishly, if that's the right word, being the ones who have ultimate ownership of the data? And until airlines and airports, in particular, you know, in this particular space, what we're talking about today, figure out how to do that, and some of them are. But I don't think that's a broad trend across the industry because of this ownership of data issue. And that's ownership from a, a legal perspective and a strategic perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I um, totally agree with you there. It's the, I, even if the customers said, yes, go for it, share everything, um, I, you know, we still have the ownership of the, you know, of the customer issue. Which I think once the, actually once everyone realizes the customer owns the customer and then they own their own data um, and you know it, there is a mechanism to allow them to give those permissions more freely, I think everyone probably will do really well. I think it's just everyone needs to get over it a little bit it's quite um <laughs> it's, <laughs> we, we like I said and I, I you know we're we're still trying to find an airline, an airport, and another airline partner that want to sit down around a table. We've offered to do a free workshop on that. If anyone wants to work out how we can anonymize the data, you know, the contact details as it gets passed through, or however, to try and enhance that customer experience, because I, you know, the customers are the ones that are losing out here, and if they're losing out, it means somebody's not making money. And it, I suspect everyone's stopping each other, you know, everyone's stopping that money from getting made at all, regardless of stealing it from each other, which I think is what the, you know, the the actual argument is about. People think that they're trying to control who makes the money, but no one's making the money. Yeah, so if there's a pot that's available, then yeah, exactly. yeah, people can take a slice of it, as yeah, opposed so to no pot. No, no it's shit. not impossible, yeah. it just needs to... And, and to you know, your point a little while ago, and not wanting to give you the opportunity to talk about 15 below, but obviously you know what you guys are doing, which is around communications. You know, airlines and airports not sharing data or not just figuring out how to do it gives comes back to that example that somebody gave. I don't know if it was you, Al, which was someone with the app gets the notification and the inf and the information from the airline before the people standing in the departure hall, and then you mm. create that kind of division of customers, which ultimately can't be the right thing surely so no. you know, if, if everyone just was able to work out a way of managing the data for the benefit of the passenger surely they are the most important people in this you know I've put my utopian hat on a little bit here but that ultimately should be the point right absolutely so I totally agree yeah there's only one th I always say this, there's only one thing worse than not knowing what's going on it's when you can see someone else does <laughs> it's more frustrating. Right, I'm just going to, um, so just the last point before we wrap up, because unfortunately we're running out of time, I, I, it's a shame we could talk about this all day I'm sure, but um, I just want to go around um, each of the panellists and ask them what you think is a really good technology to look into right now and what you would steer clear of because either you think it's rubbish or it's not ready or um, you know what's going to cut through the noise and what is just going to get lost so you know we've talked about chatbots quite good we've talked about messaging platforms are probably a good idea um, we've also mentioned things that maybe not so good like there's a lot of work going into VR and you know we tried Google Glasses and all that kind of thing um, are individual company apps a good idea or should people be moving more towards the big platforms like WhatsApp, WeChat, Facebook, that kind of thing. So as a, as a, as a closing quick comment, uh, Ursula, what do you think is a good thing to pursue and a good thing to just leave alone for now? Um, chatbot, social media, uh, as we said before, absolutely. Collaborative working tools even in, within the organization to create a basis to exchange and for innovation. And blockchain would be the ones um, to look into. Um, to forget about, I think it depends. 
I would somehow think, yes, question a company app, do you really want to uh, put time and effort into this? Can you not reach your passengers, your customers and clients better via their channels, which they use every day instead of creating yet another one? So that's for sure, um, I think, one to really question dependent uh, on your situation. Um, yeah, I leave it at that. Cool. Nick? Um, the things that interest me, um, it's connected to the chatbot thing, it's, it's the uh, artificial intelligence is not just giving someone something in real time, it's the ability they have to anticipate what someone needs. So it's the anticipation rather than managing an experience. So how can you ease someone through it? Uh, edge computing I think is interesting. So we've had cloud, edge computing is where you push more of the load to the, to the edge of the network, so it's more local processing on, on say, your mobile device, because that's becoming more available. Mm -hmm. Things that are perhaps sort of keep watching, it's blockchain is a keep watching for me, because it has inherent technology problems, it can't scale, it can't deal with high transaction volumes. Hence, the well, you, can't, you, can't, you can't update the ledger, glo uh, the transaction ledger globally, so there are, new, there are new platforms, the Ethereum platforms trying to get over that. So it's so a keep watching to see how that evolves. And the interesting thing about that isn't necessarily a technology, it's having a non-state based currency. Mm. The one that's not attached to a state. And that mm. to me is an interesting concept. Once the revolution dies down, we can all get back yeah, to it. Yeah, yeah, so there'll be something there. And, uh, uh, and of course smart contracts which are within the blockchain simplifies yeah. the contract handling process. One of the things we really seen is quite interesting about using blockchain technology is biometrics and identity because the ultimate personalization barrier currently in the industry is mm. your passport and border control and stuff like that. So the facial idea, recognition is also improving. Yeah, well, so. but the idea is, is and the facial recognition is there man, they do, mm. they're using it at a lot of airports already but if you could if you could attach your like, genuine identity that's been verified into a blockchain type identification process, we don't need all this passports and boarding passes and, and everything else, we can just attach it to your face or whatever that's Yeah, biomet is. whatever biometric uh, yeah. decision you've made. Yeah. Not there yet though, I would no. argue, not by long shot. Kevin? Yeah, so um, the typewriter, there's, you know, I'm, I'm getting somewhere here, the typewriter was a really <laughs> unnatural way of communicating, right, because it was clunky and it was weird. Then you get to a computer keyboard which is slightly easier to use and you can delete and all those kind of things. Then you get to touch screen and it becomes a much more um, fluid way of communicating with the device. Where this is all going to get really interesting is in voice because voice is the most natural way of communicating whether it's with each other or whether it's with a brand. So I think it's maybe not in the next six months or in the next year and a half or whatever we'll be talking about 2018 here, but not being a not understanding the opportunity that voice communication is going to or the effect that voice communication is going to have on a brand is probably at something that it would be an error on any any brand's part, in particular airlines, because people were going to just want instant communication or in the case of disruption or whether it's a booking or anything like that. So that's the things to focus on. Um, ones to drop, I mean, virtual reality, I think, uh, gets a bit of a bad rap. It is a gimmick at the moment, but it is something that I think is just going to happen anyway, whether we like it or not, or whether we think it's going to be a gimmick. And I, I kind of agree on this, the company apps idea that there is perhaps less emphasis should be made on providing the most amazing um, airline app or a company app. You know, the, to, you know, the Lord of the Rings reference, at some point there will be one app to rule them all. <laughs> and it probably, won't, it probably won't be one that's designed by British Airways or any other airline for fear of picking yeah. on British Airways. It will be done by a platform and it will handle yeah. everything. Great stuff. Um, all right, we've run out of time unfortunately, so uh, thank you everyone. It's been brilliant. Just to wrap up, can we... Uh, okay. There's been so many great tips um, uh, throughout. My favourite being Slice the Elephant from Ashley. I love that. Um, but I think we've all. Uh, I, think... <laughs> I wasn't sure if I misheard that or not. I was. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's brilliant. I love it. I think that's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the things that I've really learned out today, particularly talking to um, the, you know, we're talking to everyone, but I think coming from our two great consultants here, it's about you know trying to get this clearly, trying to like I think it's probably I think technology innovation is probably about as much with interacting with your various stakeholders in a meaningful way 
and forming a plan as it is about anything to do with the actual technology, which is quite interesting. But I think we all know that we need to, um, you know, keep the passenger at the core of all of this and make sure that they're behind all of our thinking. Um, I think, you know, what the point on the screen there about it all being a slow burning process, even though the, the relentless pace of the future keeps coming along quicker and quicker, it, the way those things evolve in a practical sense, it, you know, you've got to keep an eye on where it's going to go next. Kevin's example there is brilliant about, you know, user interfaces. Virtual reality at the moment might be a bit useless or be a great fun, but I was at an installation recently where you know they'd stuck it a uh, virtual reality helmet on a, an 80 year old guy and he got that straight away because he knows how to navigate around a 3D space and he knows how to do visual and auditory input because we all live there so you know there might be opportunities for that in the future. Um, also you know any channel we banged on about it all the way through this don't get too hooked up on one particular thing you know uh, Facebook Messenger isn't going to be the way of the future it's just a part of the future. And you know, as as our chatbots and everything else, yeah. And I think this is just a, a you know a good final point on this is that you you need to have faith in people when it comes to technology. Um, I think getting we've talked about getting you know the user input and keeping the passengers a hand, but I think you know we need to accept that technology. Um, we have to be optimistic about the way everyone's going to use this technology rather than scared about it. Um, so that concludes uh, our session for today. Um, there's some information in here about us which will go out when we send the slide deck out. If anyone's interested in how we can help you, um, you know, develop your messaging capabilities and how you handle customer service, just let us know. Um, there's also going to be some contact details for us and the speakers. Um, so it just remains for me to say thank you very much for all of our, uh, to all of our panelists for helping out today. It's been really interesting um, and thanks very much guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everybody. All right. We'll see you for the next one in, in a couple of months' time. Thanks.